In today's video, we are going to continue our exploration of air and weather, which are obviously very important to us pilots. Now today we are going to break down moisture in clouds, which if you are a CAP cadet, is Aerospace Dimensions Module 3, Chapter 4. Now my name is Bob Roberts, I'm the Aerospace Education Officer for the Civil Air Patrol in Greenville, South Carolina. I want to thank you for watching. Now you're going to learn a lot of great information in this video, so let's go ahead and get started. Now by the end of this video, you're going to be able to do the following six things. You're going to be able to describe the condensation process, describe how saturation occurs, define the dew point, precipitation, fog, and turbulence. To start the conversation today, we're going to discuss moisture. Without it, we have nothing that could create the weather on our planet. We would be a dry, lifeless planetary body like so many other planets. Now moisture is what allows us to create the clouds, rain, snow, fog. If you live in a cold environment, you are used to being moisture being a solid in the form of snow or ice. Now, if you live in the South, like I do, you're used to it being a gas, causing the air to feel hot and sticky. Now, one of the great ways to deal with the hot and sticky air in the summertime is to jump into a pool, which is our third state of water, which can be a liquid. At normal pressures, water moisture, when in a solid or liquid form, has roughly the same density. But when it's a gas, the amount of water vapor in a given space can vary dramatically. We call water molecules that are suspended in air, humidity. It can be super dry like in a desert, or the air can feel almost moist with the air holding lots of water. Now this percentage of water molecules suspended in the air is called the relative humidity. When the air reaches 100% of the amount of moisture that it can hold, we say that the air is saturated. Air does not, however, have a set level of saturation at all times. It changes with both pressure and temperature. The colder the air at normal ground level atmospheric pressures, the less moisture the air will hold. The hotter the air, the more moisture the air can hold. This is why it can feel so stuffy on a hot summer day. The air is holding more moisture than a cold winter day. Now the exact temperature that the air will be at when it is saturated and holding all the moisture that is in the air is called the dew point. It is constantly changing depending on the temperature and how much moisture is in the air at a given time. If the temperature drops, condensation forms. This is why a glass with a cold drink on a hot day has water forming on the outside of it. Or why when you wake up in the morning after a hot and humid day, you find water on the grass, even though it didn't rain the night before. It's there because the air got cooler than the dew point, or the surface got cooler, and the moisture condensed on that surface. This condensation is how we get the clouds, fog, snow, rain, and ice. Now when moisture condenses onto a particulate in the air that was floating, it can make that particulate heavier. And eventually, when it becomes heavy enough and falls out of the air, we call it rain, snow, or ice, as those who have lived in the hailstorm can tell you, ice falling out of the sky not very much fun much of the time. Now as a side note, if you go outside after a nice rain shower, you might notice the air seems clearer. And then you would actually be right. The moisture is grabbing the particulates in the air and bringing them to the ground. So the rain is really helping to clean the air. Now ice causes a lot of problems, especially on airplanes. It can build up on the wings, on the propellers, and reduce the amount of lift the wings are generating both by changing the shape of the airfoil, as well as making the surface rough and the air inducing more drag as it goes over it. Now, at the same time, the ice is adding to the weight. So if you remember our four forces of flight, external icing affects all of them. It reduces thrust. Since the propeller is an airfoil, it can build up on ice. It reduces lift on the main wings. It adds to the weight of the aircraft, as it also increases drag on the aircraft. Many perfectly good airplanes have not survived when they encountered icing conditions. This is why it is so crucial that you get and keep updated on weather reports so that you don't put your airplane into a situation it isn't designed for. Now that was just the external problems with icing. There is one significant internal problem with icing, and that is in airplanes that have carburetors. Now if you would like to learn more about these, I have a video on aircraft engines that you can see here. We talk about how carburetors get icing and what you can do to prevent it. But for this conversation, just understand that a carburetor mixes fuel and air and gives it to the engine. When the carburetor gets iced up, it can restrict this fuel air mixture, causing a drop in power from the engine or the engine stopping running altogether. So yeah, basically an icicle dropping out of the sky is not something you want to try to fly. Now this is beyond the scope of this lesson, 
but there are some types of airplanes that actually have a parachute built into them. I'm going to show a picture of one here. They can be used to save you and your passengers if you accidentally get into a situation like that. Cirrus is one popular brand. However, you want to make sure that you don't use that as a reason to get into icing. You want to avoid icing at all costs. This movement of moisture from liquid form in the lakes and oceans to gas form that we call humidity and also maybe to a solid form, which can be ice crystals and clouds, uh, and moving back and forth to precipitation such as rain and ice falling out of the skies. We call that the overall water cycle. As we can see in this chart, the water moves throughout an entire system, including being in the ground, providing moisture for life in the ground, and the roots of plants and trees. Now that you understand moisture, let's talk about the clouds that it helps to make. Clouds really are just water condensation, either in liquid form or frozen form that stays suspended in the atmosphere. If it were heavy enough, it would fall out of the air in the form of either rain, snow, or ice. We have three basic forms of clouds. We have the cumulus, the stratus, and the cirrus. These are described by how they look and how high in the atmosphere they sit. The cumulus clouds often look like fluffy cotton balls that sit closer to the earth. I consider them our happy clouds because they indicate good weather and fairly smooth flying. They do have some vertical motion to them, which is how they get puffy, but they don't have a very high degree of vertical motion, which will be discussed in a later cloud type. One of my absolute favorite things to do as a pilot is to go flying when there are a bunch of cumulus clouds dotting the sky and flying all around them. The turbulence can be a little bumpy since there is some vertical movement to the air, but you get used to that pretty fast and it is truly one of the times where you really start to feel like a bird and you can just play in the clouds. So just be on the lookout though for other airplanes doing the same thing or airplanes that are on instrument flight plans that are flying through the clouds because that silver lining everybody talks about might just be an airplane traveling several hundred miles an hour coming right at you. So now seriously though, so this is just something that just makes me happy as a pilot. So uh, if you get a chance, yeah, go do that. So the next cloud form is the stratus clouds. Now the, the stratus clouds are similar to a cumulus cloud and that usually indicates good weather. It's usually a warm front coming in. Um, they can be low to the ground. They also can be really high up. Now we call them good weather and low turbulence clouds because they don't have a lot of vertical movement in the air. If they did, they wouldn't be so low to the ground or you know, they would, wouldn't be so flat. They would be up and down. Now the stratus cloud does differ visually from the cumulus clouds in that they are pretty thin and very flat looking and usually indication of less vertical movement of the air as opposed to the cumulus clouds that look puffy. So the stratus clouds also, they look a little gray instead of the bright white that we make up of the cumulus clouds. And then the last of the three major cloud forms is the cirrus clouds. Now, unlike the other two uh, clouds that can be at different altitudes, the cirrus clouds tend to be at the high altitudes only. And they look white and they thin and they look wispy. Uh, they're also typically made up of ice crystals because they're up high and the water droplets tend to freeze as opposed to lower levels, which tend to be more liquid and more rainy. Um, now, the basic types of cloud formations, we're going to expand that into 10 basic cloud types that we are going to result from those formations. We are going to break them down into the altitudes that the clouds generally are sitting in. We call them high-level clouds, mid-level clouds, and low-level clouds. So the high-level clouds sit at above 20,000 feet, and we attach the prefix zero to the formation name. So zero cumulus or zero stratus, and just plain cirrus. As mentioned earlier, because these clouds are so high, they are sitting in the air where temperature freezes the moisture. Hey, if you're a Disney fan, and if you like Frozen, Anna and Nelson, you can fly through clouds of ice crystals, just like them. Anyways, uh, the cirrus clouds sit high and maintain that white wispy look to them. You can see them when there is typically a warm front or when the jet stream is directing the air circulation. So the cirrus stratus clouds tend to look like they are in a thin, widespread veil looking cloud formations. Now, as a warm front continues to move forward, you can see the wispy cirrus clouds begin to push into cirrus stratus clouds. The warm front can further push the clouds into lower levels. The cirrus version of the cumulus clouds are called, amazingly, cirrus cumulus. Isn't science amazing? Who would have thought? Anyways, uh, these are our fluffy friends, but at the high altitudes, we tend to see them more from the bottoms, and therefore they look more bumpy on the bottoms, uh, rather than the big fluffy clouds that you see from the sides. So depending on the airflow, you may also see them organize themselves into layers of thin lines, and those might resemble streets. 
So our mid-level clouds take on the prefix alto, alto meaning middle, such as how the alto sax and the viola plays the alto clef, which sits in the middle of the bass and treble clefs. Now I play viola, so long live the alto clef, because we are truly special people that others, they just don't understand us. So that's what it is. So as it was with the cirrus, we now had uh, alto to our cloud formations, which gives us the alto stratus and alto cumulus. Now alto stratus are a flat looking cloud, and again, they indicate a approach of a warm front, and we'll start to push together creating thicker clouds. If they're thick enough, we may get some sprinkling of rain, but they're not the big, big rainstorms. The alto cumulus clouds give us our puffy clouds, but at the middle levels between 6,500 and the 20,000 feet where we start our high level clouds. Lastly, we get into our low level clouds, as well as the Godzilla of all clouds. Unlike the high and mid-level clouds, these clouds do not get a prefix like Cirrus or Alto, but they do keep the strato and cumulus formation names. Also, these clouds, because of their lower altitude, are often liquid water, unless the air is really cold, like it's in the wintertime, you're up north. Now, because the water is liquid, it can absorb and give off a great deal of energy in the form of heat. Also, remember, temperature and heat are not the same. See this video three in this series if you want to know why. So remember the stratus clouds tend to not have a lot of vertical movement to the air, and cumulus clouds are puffy because they do have vertical motion. Now the stratus clouds at lower level give us the gray, gloomy clouds that we may or may not have rain showers as part of them. Now these types of clouds do tend to hang out for a while, and they can persist for hours and days at a time. Unlike the flat and uniform stratus clouds, our puffy friends come back and the cumulus clouds tend to be clumped together uh, just in smaller cells as opposed to a flat uh, ranging of clouds. Just consider them socially distanced clouds. The clouds have flat bottoms and the tops are rounded. Uh, similar to the high and mid-level cousins, these clouds indicate that the air is moving vertically. These clouds will vary depending on how much vertical movement there is. When there is a great deal of energy in the clouds and a mass of vertical movement, the clouds will progress into a cumulonimbus cloud and with further development into an incredible and awe-inspiring thunderstorm. As pilots, unless you are flying aircraft designed for it, you do not want anything to do with a thunderstorm. It can throw you around like a rag doll. Even if you are in a plane designed to handle the stresses, you want to make sure you slow down to penetration airspeed, or what in aviation we call maneuvering airspeed. And make sure you're strapped in, because you're about to have a bumpy ride. We have just one cloud type left. Congrats on making it this far. Next time someone asks you if your head's in the clouds, ask them if they mean strato or cumulus. Trust me, it's gonna help you make friends, I promise. So our last cloud type is a lenticular cloud. You see these near the mountains, and they are also called Alto Cumulus Standing Lenticulars, or ACLS. That name tells you more about them. It tells you that they are mid-level clouds with vertical air movements, and they can form creating waves in the air. The glider pilots love these clouds, as they can use these vertical movements of the air to gain incredible altitudes, 50,000 feet. So they can fly a lot longer. Now, unless you're a glider pilot though, the vertical movement of the air in the more compressed mountain waves means you are likely to experience significant turbulence. So unless you need them for the lift, you will want to avoid them if you can. Okay, that's it for today's lesson. We covered a lot. What I would like for you to do now, while this information is still fresh in your memory, go outside and see what type of clouds there are. Also, if you're watching other online content that takes place outside, what type of clouds are in the background? Imagine that you were a pilot flying above the, the heads of the people talking. Would the air be smooth? Would it be rough? Would you have rising air? Okay. Now also, if you're a CAP member, I love hearing from the different squadrons that are learning from this content. Please post your squadron name in the comments section down below. And lastly, if you're a CAP cadet studying for your aerospace dimensions, module three, chapter four test, please pause the video at the end of this for some important vocabulary. You're gonna to have to know this vocabulary for your test. Now in our last video in this series, we're going to discuss the weather systems and weather changes. I hope to see you then. Till then, I hope you have a great day. And lastly, if you have enjoyed this content, please hit that like button and the subscribe button. And if you click the bell icon, it will notify you when new content comes out. It really does help the channel, so I appreciate that. With that, we'll see you soon, and thanks everybody. Goodbye.